morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to those who are watching also. Um, we have Pastor Bob Smith here today. This is our, uh, we can get the sermon. And uh, if any of you are visitors, there are cards in the pew that you can fill out and put in the offering plate. Is there anyone who has any announcements of any kind? Thank you. <clears throat> At this time, let us now be still before the Lord as we prepare our hearts for the word. morning, I was led to go through Psalm 46. Psalm 46, it's on page 427 in the Bible. God is our refuge and strength, never present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear though the earth get away and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and fall and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord God Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. 
I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. So this bound prayer. <coughs> Father of all things, we thank you for all you have done in this past week, for your mercy and provision. You knew everything that we would do before we did it, and yet you still love us. Lord, you know that what many of us are going through right now, whether it be health problems, work-related issues, financial setbacks, or just self-doubt, Please equip us with an unshakable faith that you are one in control and not us. Please guide us through the obedience and lead, by, lead us by your spirit, that we may surrender our will as you place us. We pray also the prayer that you taught and mentored your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not as a but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Let us now stand, if you are able, and we will sing our first hymn, Number 139, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Oh, my. 
Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Lord God, we recognize your presence here with us this morning. We recognize your great faithfulness to us. We thank you for all the gifts that you give to us. We thank you for all the mercies we see each day. Father, we lift up those who are hurting and struggling and having a hard time of life, whether it's health issues or whether it's work-associated issues or maybe struggles in a family. Father, we ask that you just pour out your grace and mercy on each one of us. Father, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus. We thank you for what he did on the cross, that while he was there, he took our sins and paid the price and the penalty that we should have paid to you. We thank you for the great hope that is ours in Jesus. We thank you for the fact that um, when the end of times come, that because of our relationship with Jesus, we will be in your presence. Father, again, just uh, bless this time, bless the message, the music, and all that we do together. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, 
And if you'd like to stand, we'll be singing our worship song, Behold Our God.
to be here this morning with you. It's always nice coming to this church. I always feel very welcomed by you that are here, and I'm glad that I can fill in for Pastor Kim. I want to read to you from Matthew 14, beginning with verse 22 through verse 33. It's a familiar passage of scripture to us. Um, I know also the men will be talking about what I have to say on Tuesday night, so I better be at my best today. So... Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get out into a boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up into the mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, uh, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. Is it a ghost? They said and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. The Lord is, if, I'm sorry, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come on the water. Come, he said. Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water towards Jesus, um, but when he saw the wind and he was afraid, he began to sink and cry out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out with his hand, caught him. You of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, this is the Son of God. I'm going to do something a little different this morning. I'm going to sit in a chair. And I'm going to share my message from sitting in a chair. <laughs> it could be easier to put it on. Thank you. It's always good to have a tech person in the crowd. <laughs> Why I'm doing this this morning is that I want you to feel like we're sitting over a cup of coffee or tea, that we might be having dinner or lunch together, 
that we might be at, um, well, zips or shady acres or the 99 or cellos or any place that would make us feel comfortable. I also like Greg's. I don't know how many of you know where Greg's is, but I like Greg's. This may work and this may not. Oh, I may just have to hold it, that's all. Nope, that's in there though. No, it's okay. It'll be okay. It's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Now, those of you who are going to critique me on Tuesday night, just remember I had trouble getting started. When you preach for 37 years in the same location, you begin to do some stuff differently. So I moved from the pulpit to sitting in a chair to standing and there's no middle aisle, but I'd walk down the middle aisle at the church. I wanted people to be engaged in what was going on. I want people to think about there in the story. Um, and again, I think that communication is best done when one is sitting and talking to people over a meal. A lot of times when I go back to West Springfield, there's certain people that I know who have had troubles in their life and um, I'll call them ahead of time and ask if they can have lunch with me that day. And most of them might be retired and they will say yes. And it gives me a chance to get caught up in what's happening with them. By the way, I may ask you some questions this morning looking for you to respond. What? <laughs> so if, if you want to respond, just put up your hand. I'll point you out and just speak up so we can hear what you have to say. The story I read to you this morning is a great story. And I could fit into that story. It's probably in my top 10, if not the top five passages of scripture that I like. I can identify with Peter. I'm eager to do things. And then after I think about it, I think, why was I so stupid to say yes? Now we in the story might think that Peter's stupid because he gets out of a boat in a raging storm. Would we get out of a boat in a raging storm? How many of you have ever uh, experienced thinking you were going to drown? Okay, okay, me too. I was 10. I was at a friend's house, neighbors next door to us in Somerville. My dad was a pastor in Somerville at that time. Um, and we went to their place for, the, for a day in the summer. My brother and I were out swimming in uh, inner tubes. Mine flipped over. My mother, because I got so burnt by the sun, wanted me to wear a t-shirt. I knew that if I could get to the edge of the boat, I could put my foot on dry or, or land where I could walk and not drown. It was the most petrifying thing that I've ever experienced in my life. So for Peter to get out of the boat in the midst of the storm, I'm thinking to myself, you are nuts. You are nuts. And yet that's what he does. So what catches your eye? What grabs your attention? What, what do you stop and think about? Anybody got any ideas? What do you think about when you hear the story about Peter and getting out of the boat? Was that a wise move? Not a wise move? Go ahead. I think when he got on the boat, he had faith. Yes, I believe that is true. I believe that's true. And that's, that's one of the things of why he got out of the boat. He wanted to know if the person walking on the water was a ghost or was Jesus. And he says to Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come. Jesus had finished feeding 15,000 people. We estimate that because there were 5,000 men. The women weren't counted. The children weren't counted. Some people would say as high as 20,000, but I always say it's probably 15,000. Husband, wife, and one child. And he fed them with a Happy Meal from McDonald's. I did that one Sunday morning. I had somebody go get me a Happy Meal for breakfast. 
And I said to people who want something of this. So there was bacon and there was pancakes and there was uh, orange juice and I guess, oh, maple syrup. So I said to him, who wants the orange juice? So somebody put up their hand. I said, here you go. I'm sorry, you can't, everybody else can have the orange juice unless you want to drink out of the same glass somebody else drank out of. Then I said to him, who wants pancakes? And I had somebody with a little knife cutting off pancakes. Who wants maple syrup? Oh, you need that for the pancakes. So the one who gets the pancakes gets the maple syrup. And people were upset that there wasn't enough to go around for everybody. I said, well, that's the point. When you look at five loaves and two fish, the two fish were sardines, the five loaves were barley loaves, and they were very small, you did not have enough to feed 15,000 people. Jesus made it possible. I always think of the disciples standing there waiting for whatever Jesus was going to do to do it and then fill whatever they had so they could pass it out. And so their plates are full and they go and pass it out. And I'm thinking, well, that's only good. What happens the next time? They go back, the plates are full, the plates are full, the plates are full, the plates are full. So full that at the end of the time, Jesus has collected everything that's left over. And there were 12 large baskets of food. So not only did Jesus provide enough for everybody to eat, he provided leftovers for the disciples. Some of you don't like leftovers. We used to have leftover soup. Whatever was still in the refrigerator after three or four days, we threw it in a pot and we made soup out of it. We did nothing uh, get by us, uh, especially when we were kids. By the way, Jesus' original plan was to dismiss the crowd and to get some R&R &R for himself and for the disciples. So Jesus goes up to the hills. He wants to spend some time alone with God. He wants to be praying. And he sends the fishermen, some, but all of the disciples in a fishing boat and tells them to go across the Sea of Galilee. Suddenly a storm comes up. That's why it's called a sea. It's not a sea, it's a lake. But because of the way the, the mountains around that lake happened, when the wind would gush down, you would have waves and you would have strong winds and you were afraid, even seasoned fishermen were afraid. It's not your usual storm. In fact, according to verse 27, it says, they are being buffeted by the waves. By the way, the word for tormented, which is used, it is, comes out of the context of meaning that there's some kind of um, demonic hostility towards people. Do you think Satan was the one who was causing all those problems for those men? Seasoned fishermen who were afraid they were going to drown. We know in Mark's gospel that Jesus can see all of this while he's praying. So he's praying, but he's also looking out. He sees that the disciples are having trouble. And so he ceases his prayer and he begins to walk on the water. I've got a pastor friend who does not believe this is a miracle. It believes that they were just, he was walking by the shore and the boat drifted over towards the shore and then Jesus was able to get onto the boat. I don't think so. It doesn't talk about that in the scriptures. It talks about the fact that sometime between 3 and 6 a.m. Jesus meets his disciples who are petrified. And oddly enough, Jesus is walking on the water. Somebody else said he knew where all the stones were. I said, well, Peter didn't, and yet he still got out of, out of the boat. I don't know if that would freak you out, but it would freak me out. If I thought I was going to sink and I didn't have a life preserver, I'd be in big trouble. Seems like this is happening to the disciples. In fact, in verse 26, that it says that they are fearful and terrified, and they cry out thinking Jesus is a ghost. The Greek word used here is P-H- a-N-T-A-S-M-A, -A -A, which means aberration or specter associated with magic. Not pneuma, what could be translated ghost. 
So they see this, what looks like a dismembered, maybe kind of person who's kind of walking on the water, who's coming towards them, and they're not sure what's going to happen. They believe it's out of the ordinary. But how does Jesus respond? Anybody remember from the scriptures? He told them, it's, it's Jesus. That's what he says, it's Jesus. I'm coming to help you. However, because of the presence of Jesus, the fear could be overcome. Do you realize that anywhere you go, anything you face, anything you deal with can be overcome by Jesus? All the fears, all the worries, all the anxieties that you have can be helped out by Jesus. I've had two experiences happen to me since November, both on a Sunday morning, both standing up, both being like Mitch McConnell, the light's on, but nobody's home. Some people have said it lasts seven minutes. I don't know. Once it was done in the church that I've been all the time, that I've preached in a lot, and it happened. So today, my biggest fear was I was going to have another Mitch McConnell day. Because I don't know when it's going to happen. It just happens. So what I did today as I drove here, all I did was pray and say to God, please don't have it be Mitch McConnell day. Because the people didn't come to see Mitch McConnell saying nothing. They came to hear something from the word of God. So Peter is interested in uh, everything that's raging on. And so he cries out, Jesus, Lord, if it is you, imagine questioning Jesus. How many times have we questioned Jesus? Things aren't going right. Things aren't going the way we planned. Things aren't happening the way we thought they would. Where are you, Jesus? I thought if I gave my life to you, that it would be smooth sailing. Mm -mm. Scripture tells us that we are going to have times of troubles and heartaches and sorrows. But Jesus is going to be there in the midst of that. You know, when we're going through difficult things as far as health issues are concerned, oftentimes people will say, well, Jesus doesn't really love me because if he loved me, I wouldn't be going through this. I said, the scripture does not promise you a rose garden. It pro promises you times of heartache and sorrow and trouble and that he is going to be present. present. When Peter cries out and says, Lord, if it is you, in the Greek it really means, Lord, it is you. Not if, but it is you. So he knew that Jesus was out there by hearing his voice. And so he says, since it's you, call me to come out of the boat. Now remember, the waves are still raging. The wind is still blowing. They still think they're going to die. And Jesus puts one foot over the boat the second foot over the boat, and lo and behold, he's walking towards Jesus. But you know what? Sometimes when you make that risk and you're walking towards Jesus, you get overcome by the things that are around you. And what happened to Peter was, oh my gosh, the winds are still raging. The water's still rough. He took his eyes off Jesus, and what happens? Bye, Peter. I see, if I had been Jesus, I would have just kind of looked over and said, oh, so you thought you had faith? You don't have any faith? I'm not going to, well, I'll help you out eventually. Once you learn your lesson, he doesn't. He reaches out immediately. I think even before Jesus, uh, Peter goes under the water and pulls him out of the water. Now, we can't do it like today you can do it. There's no kind of zips. You know, pull him out of the water, you zipped over the boat. Jesus and Peter walked to the boat together. What does the scripture tell us? Once they get into the boat, the storm stops. And what do the disciples say? Oh my God, 
they worship Jesus as if he were the son of God. Even though they didn't know that Jesus was the son of God, they worshiped him as the son of God. I mean, they knew, but they didn't really know as we now know today. An interesting thing happened to me this week. I got a number of um, devotionals on my email. And twice this week, this verse came up. It's from Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. We are now entrusted to trust the Lord with all our heart and to lean, not lean on our own understanding. God wants us to learn in his care today and not depend upon our abilities to manage life. You know, the thing that strikes me is that, you know, I went to college, I went to seminary. I thought, well, God trained me to do the work of being a pastor. And so if I'm asking God to help me out, that's a sign of weakness. So I would try to do the best I could with the gifts that God gave me to accomplish the things that God wanted me to accomplish. But that didn't always work. The thing is that even though God prepares us and trains us to do the work he's called us to do, he wants us to depend on him. Fear and anxiety are two of the worst things that plague us in the United States. A daughter is somebody who suffers from anxiety. God wants us, Jesus wants us to know that when we exercise faith, Jesus will be there. The Holy Spirit is present in us. So when we exercise the faith that God has given us, then we can accomplish wonderful things. Peter did until he began to realize, what a fool I am. And he almost drowned. Jesus is not a fool. Jesus is the one that God sent so that he could show us how to live with each other and how we could help each other in times of need. And then he put the Holy Spirit in us so that the Bible says that we could do greater things than Jesus. I haven't called anybody out of the dead, so I can't do that greater than Jesus. But what I understand now in my retirement is that God wants me to just have faith in what he wants me to accomplish, I can accomplish through him. And Jesus chastised Peter because he said, you of little faith. How often might he chastise us because we have little faith? I'm not trying to be the downer this morning. I'm just trying to say that the thing that we need to exercise in our life is faith. We need to believe Jesus is who he is, that God can do what he, what he says he can do, that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. You talk to young people a lot. I used to have a church right next to the high school. And I was allowed to be in the high school. I was well known by the, the staff in the high school. I'd go in for lunch and I'd sit with kids. We would just talk, you know? But one of the things that we'd have a hard time dealing with was the word of God. You believe that is all true? It's either true or it's not true. Oh, I'll, I'll just pick the red letter stuff. Well, in the new Bibles, there's no red letters. It's either true or it's not true. Well, I don't believe it's true. I believe it is. Well, how can you believe it is? Because when I read it, it applies to my life and how to live my life. It'll do the same for you. I don't believe it. I can't make you believe it. But if it's not all true, then whatever is false or fiction or a story or whatever, if that's coming through to you and not the positiveness of how that applies to my life, then it's not going to be meaningful to you. That's the biggest challenge facing us as Christians today. 
Do we trust the word of God? Do we believe the stories in the word of God? And are we willing to use them as we share about God's love with others? Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for your word as being truth. I thank you for your faithfulness to us even when we're unfaithful to you. I thank you for loving us, caring about us, ministering to us, wanting to take away our fears and our anxieties. Help us to turn to you when we feel anxious or when we feel stressed or when we feel out of sorts, knowing that you can provide the peace that we need in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And as the offering is brought up, we're going to be singing Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. and offerings to you. We ask that you would use them to uh, continue the work of your kingdom in this place. We ask that you would multiply them too so that others around the world might be touched by your love and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. And our last hymn will be My Faith Looks Up to Thee.
for this bow and prayer. Lord, as we leave this sanctuary to go back out there this week and deal with whatever is coming our way, please pour your spirit over us and lead us on the path we should follow. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you daily. Now may the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he never leave us or forsake us. May he turn our hearts to him to walk in obedience and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws which he has given to us. May he cover and protect us and our families in the week ahead. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Oh.